thank you everyone for joining today's webinar on the NIHR Academy's uh, Global Health Research Training Awards. My name is Charlotte Minter and I'm one of the Senior Programme Managers at the NIHR Academy based in Leeds uh, in the UK and I oversee the two small Global Health Research Training uh, Awards that will be the main focus of today's webinar. So um, before we go on to this, um, I just really want to emphasise that the webinar is really aimed at those individuals based in one of our current uh, NIHR Global Health Research programmes. So specifically the NIHR funded Global Health Research units and groups, and also our NIHR Right and HPSR programmes. And it's really those who have an active NIHR research contract until February 2023. Um, and then would be eligible to apply for one of these awards that we'll be talking about. Um, I'll explain more as we go through the webinar, um, but I'll let my two co-hosts co introduce themselves. Um, so Dilly, if I could start with yourself and then Pallavi, please. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, my name's uh, Dilly Anumba. Um, I'm Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Chair of the NIHR Global Health Research uh, training and Career Development Awards. Very good to be on this program, and I thank you all for attending. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Pallavi Mulidharan, and uh, I'm a project manager for the NIHR uh, Right Program, Prevention of Epilepsy by Reducing Neonatal Encephalopathy. Uh, I'm also a PhD student at uh, Imperial College London. Uh, thank you for having me here. Lovely. Thanks, both of you. Okay, so I just briefly want to um, go over today's agenda for the webinar. So firstly, I want to provide some context uh, regarding the NIHR and its role, as I'm aware that people will be joining from different countries and may be less familiar with the NIHR. Uh, then I'll move on to talk about the two Global Health Research Training Awards um, that have recently launched, um, before handing over a say to Dilly to talk about what makes a competitive uh, Global Health Spark application before then handing over to Labby uh, to talk about her research career journey and experience of undertaking a, a spark placement and hopefully giving us some top tips. Um, then we'll allow time at the end for the Q&A and then you'll also have a chance to ask any specific questions of, of Dilly and Pallavi while they're, while they're here and make the most of their experience. So the National Institute for Health Research plays a central role in England's health and care research landscape and is funded by the Department of Health and Social Care. So working in partnership, uh, we fund, enable um, and deliver world leading health and social care research that improves people's health and well-being and promotes economic growth. So this slide really nicely summarises our six core work streams. However, it's the area at the top right hand side of the slide. Um, which is the NIHR Academy's main area of focus and is also the organisation where I'm based. So the NIHR Academy attract, train and support the best researchers to tackle the complex health and care challenges of the future. So people like Pallavi um, with one of our placement awards. So we are passionate about people and developing careers in research and really do appreciate that um, in order to conduct the very best research, it really isn't possible without investing in the people um, who do that. Um, so in 2016, the NIHR began work on developing a, a global health research portfolio focused on funding a high quality health and care research for the primary benefit of those people living in low and middle income countries, which is funded by the UK government official development assistance uh, known as ODA. So in order to be funded um, for any of our programmes, it really needs to meet uh, the criteria for ODA funding. So significant investment in training and academic research capacity strengthening is being delivered through our NIHR Global Health Research Programme. And it's this programme um, that we will be talking about today. Um, and this programme includes our Global Health Research Units and Groups and also our NIHR Research and Innovation for Global Health Transformation Programme, and also our Global Health Policy System Research Programme. Um, there is also a considerable amount of academic research capacity strengthening that's already being delivered um, through our NIHR Global Research Professorship Personal Awards. So 
the aim of the NIHR Academy and their training programme is to build on this investment, um, supporting those individuals who are actively pursuing academic research careers within one of those programmes. Um, and really to enhance early career researchers' training experience, as well as their networks and career opportunities. So I'm sure we will have been joined um, by a number of global health research training leads today. Um, and each of those global health units and groups, Wright and HPSR programme awards has a local training lead. So their role is really to develop and deliver a local training strategy for their individual GHR programme and then communicate with the, um, any of our global health research training opportunities to their academy members. So that brings me on to who are academy members and what it means to be a member. So we have a definition um, which is highlighted in this slide um, that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, and it's for those individuals who are actively pursuing an academic research career in a global health program award or via a Global Health Research Professorship Award and are being supported in their personal and professional academic career development. So it's these individuals who we refer to as Academy members. I realise obviously some of our definitions can be a little complicated. So as I say, please do get in touch either with your local training lead or ourselves at the NIHR Academy if you have any questions regarding the definition um, and who, is, who may or may not be a member, we're more than happy to, to take those queries. So I now um, want to focus on what obviously the main part of today's webinar is about. Um, we obviously have two small training awards. So the first one is the Global Health Research Short Placement Award for Research Collaboration, um, which is a personal award open to those uh, Academy members who we've just spoken about. Um, and the second award um, is a new award um, called the Global Health Research Cohort Academic Career Development Award. So as I say, this is a cohort award and open to uh, all our global health programme training leads and directors. So we're delighted to have launched both of these awards yesterday um, and they're currently open for applications at the moment and then we'll close to applications on the 17th of March. So if we start with our first personal award, as I say, this is the Global Health Research Short Placement Award for Research Collaboration or SPARC as we call it. So what is the aim of the SPARC scheme? So this award really is about investing in individuals and enhancing their research training experience and, and academic career development. So the scheme provides opportunities for academy members to apply for funding to design and undertake um, a short placement with, within one of our global health programmes or in other parts of the NIHR to network, to train in a specific technique, or collaborate uh, with other relevant researchers and, and specialists. So that's really the, the main premise of the award. So who is this award specifically aimed at and who would be eligible to apply? Unfortunately, I'm afraid there isn't time to go over all of the eligibility criteria for this award in, in great detail. So I'm just gonna focus on um, some of the key points really, but would encourage you to really read the SPARC guidance notes um, which are available on the NIHR website, which really go into a lot more detail um, of the criteria and also explain some of the terminology that we, we use as well. Um, so the Global Health Spark, as I say, is aimed at academy members based in the UK or in a lower middle income country um, who are receiving financial or in-kind support from their NIHR uh, Global Health Unit or group, right, um, and HSP. Um, HSPR um, programme award or via a global um, research professorship award to actively pursue an academic research career. So individuals must be undertaking a, a pre-doctoral fellowship, a master's, a PhD or a postdoctoral fellowship um, and are being supported by their global health um, programme award to apply for a formal career development award. So it's really one, one of those, you either are currently undertaking one of those awards or you're being supported to apply for an award. And that's those, it's these people who would be eligible to apply and who we're focusing this award on. There are also a number of criteria um, related to individuals supporting environment. 
So each uh, Global Health Programme Award has a, a lead organisation who holds the NIHR research contract with the Department for Health and Social Care. And also there are often a number of partner organisations who are part of that global um, research work called official collaborating institutions. So in order to be eligible to apply for the SPARC scheme, applicants substantive employer, so whoever they hold their contract of employment with, must be listed as an official collaborating institution and a named party in their global health programmes current collaboration agreement or within their NIHR Global Research Professorship Award. So as I say, I realise that some of the, this criteria can be a little tricky to understand. So as I say, please do read the guidance notes, um, but, but most importantly, please do get in touch with ourselves and the team at the Academy because we're more than happy to, to answer any questions regarding eligibility. Um, so what I want to really focus on, obviously, if individuals are um, eligible, what can they do and where can they go for their placement? So there are lots of different parts of the NIHR across the global health portfolio, as well as in parts of the UK NIHR infrastructure or wider NIHR that applicants may wish to consider undertaking a, a placement in. And they're detailed in this slide. So each of these parts has a specific area of focus um, with a wide range of facilities and, and expertise. Um, but we've developed a guide, what we, what we call the, the SPARC Where Can I Go Guide, um, which details some of these different sites and centres and provides applicants with a little bit more information on the research that those, those sites and centres are involved in, their facilities and expertise. Um, so individuals really then can start to think about where they might like to undertake a placement um, that would really meet their own individual research training needs. So this slide um, hopefully summarises some of the um, types of um, potential placement applicants may want to consider. Um, for example, um, applicants might want to, who have recently finished their masters um, and are being supported by their Global Health Programme Award to, to apply for a formal academic career development award, might want to use this opportunity, for example, to spend time with a research team in a part of the NIHR that specialises in a particular technique or research method um, that would enhance their own research and use this placement really as an opportunity to meet with leading academics, discuss potential research ideas, and really then start to develop a, a PhD application, for example. However, what I really do want to um, stress is that we really would encourage you to explore the wide range of facilities, expertise, and opportunities available to you across the whole of that Global Health Programme portfolio, as well as the UK NIHR infrastructure, um, and develop a placement that really is bespoke to you um, and your individual research training needs, your particular background, your, your particular skills and experiences and set, and, and develop a placement, as I say, that's unique to you and will hopefully get you to a place where you want to be um, and help your academic career. So I say they're very much personal awards, really focused on you and your individual um, skills and experience and, and really helping to support you with developing that academic career. So how long should a placement be for? Um, we recognise the need uh, to adopt a, a flexible approach to placements because everybody's circumstances and, and, and life experiences, et cetera, are, are different. So placements may range from anything from two to three weeks um, to six months. And for this period also, it can be broken up to allow flexibility, both for the individual um, sort of who's undertaking that placement but also for the organisation where they're going to do their placement, where they'll be hosted. So I say it's very flexible um, and really, you know, for you to sort of design a placement that meets your individual needs. So funding uh, of up to £10,000 can be applied for, um, and that can include travel, accommodation, subsistence, um, in order for you to travel to undertake that placement. Um, but that funding that's available to you can also include any short training courses, for example, qualitative research methods courses and PPI courses. Um, but also that funding can um, include funding for the production of, of any relevant placement outputs. So at, at the end of your placement, there may be um, a reason for you to produce an infographic or an informative video. And that funding can be um, used to go towards that as well that will really showcase your placement. 
So I say before I um, get, I will want to talk about a little bit about the application and assessment process, um, but I'll do that at the very end of my presentation. So I'll stop sort of talking about the Spark Award now and then go on now to talk about the, the Cohort Academic Development Award, um, which is a, a new award that we've uh, recently launched as well, and just give you a bit of an overview of, of that. So as I say, this is a, a new award aimed specifically um, at training leads or programme directors. It provides an opportunity to tailor a programme of activities to meet the academic training and career development needs of their Global Health Programme Award cohort. Um, primarily focused on those who are LMIC based. All Global Health CADA applications must be informed by an academic development training needs assessment. And we expect that that programme of activities should also support relevant career development needs that are pertinent to the NHR GHR programme cohort, but also contribute to capacity strengthening of NHR Global Health Academy members. Um, and also strengthen networks and collaborations with the potential for longer term sustainability. So who is a Global Health Card Award aimed at? So as I say, the competition is open to all those training leads and programme directors who are based in a, a Global Health programme operating between July 2022 and February next year. As I say, there is the opportunity for training leads also to include um, an academy member as a co-applicant on the application. So this will really provide them with an opportunity for them to further their CV. Um, the co-applicant then also would take a, an active role in the development of the application and contribute to the planning, implementation and an evaluation conducted as part of that award. So there are many ways in which training leads may wish to use this flexible award um, to address their cohorts, academic career development needs, um, which are highlighted in the slide there. But it's really um, what I do want to focus on is that, for example, training leads um, may want to consider collaborating with other global health programmes with similar leads um, and plan a, a joint programme of activities that could, for example, be driven by a geographical or regional need, um, or for example, a particular research focus that spans multiple um, programmes. Um, but this um, opportunity might also be want to be used by training leads who may have identified needs themselves in order to help them perform their training lead role. So for example, um, leadership, mentoring, coaching skills. Um, and then they may want then to plan with other um, training leads to conduct those activities to, to meet those um, needs of the training leads. So what funding is available for a, a CADA award? Um, funding of up to £30,000 £30, can be applied for. Um, and for example, could include relevant formal training courses, uh, travel accommodation, uh, visas and subsistence funding in order for um, them to deliver that programme of activities. Uh, funding can also be used to cover any other reasonable costs required to deliver those activities, for example, um, facilitated costs, venue, hire, etc. So I realise uh, that's a little bit of a, a whistle stop tour of um, sort of the overview of both those schemes. But what I do now want to just focus on really is um, the application and assessment process. So as you're aware, um, both of those competitions launched yesterday um, and are open for applications until the 17th of March. So we really would encourage you to take a look at the NIHR Global Health web pages um, for further information about the schemes. Um, please do review those guidance notes um, for those schemes, really. Um, that would, would be something I would encourage you to do straight away. Um, in particular, have a look at the, the eligibility criteria and assessment sanctions. Um, but most importantly, as I say, the team at the Academy are more than happy to talk over any eligibility queries you might have um, and, and go through anything that um, you may want to talk to us about. We in particular ask you to, to register on our online NIHR Academy Research Awards Management Information System, um, known as Aramis, um, and you 
once you have registered on that system, you will then be able to request a, a copy of our um, Spark application form or our um, CARDA application forms. Um, and they will be then emailed to you as a, a Word document. More information, I say, how you, how you do register on this system and how you um, request a copy of the application form is detailed in the guidance notes. There's a lot of kind of step-by-step -step, um, sections, so hopefully um, some of that will be clear. Um, so once the competitions close, um, the NHR Academy undertake eligibility and remit checking, um, making sure, say, all our applications are, are eligible and fall within our, our remit. So following um, this review, all of the eligible applications um, are then assessed uh, by two members of the um, NIHR um, Training Programme Selection Committee um, before each application is then discussed um, at what we call a, a NHR funding recommendation meeting. And that meeting um, will be held in May uh, where funding recommendations will be made. Following uh, that meeting, and having gained approval from um, the Department for Health and Social Care, all the applicants will then be notified of the outcome, whether that be successful or unsuccessful, um, and we'll be notifying everybody in June. Um, also, what I do want to stress today is that if you feel that now is not necessarily appropriate time to apply for the, the Spark Award or the, the CARDA Award, um, that we will be launching a, another round towards the end of um, this year. So please, I say do keep an eye on our website and, and, and the Twitter um, pages, et cetera, because we will be um, making that announcement later on um, as to when that next round will, will launch. But I say, if now is not the, the best time, don't worry. As I say, we will be um, you know, launching the scheme again towards the end of the year. So finally, I just want to um, highlight some useful links that might be of interest to you um, and ways for you to, to get in touch if you've, you've got any queries, because that's, I say, what we're here for. We're happy to take queries. Um, I'm conscious, as I say, that I've just provided a huge amount of information in a, in a short space of time. Um, so as I say, we're more than happy to take questions at the end of this session as well. Um, but I'm now going to hand over to Dilia Number who is the uh, chair of the selection committee to talk about what makes a competitive spark application from a chair's perspective and, and really you know, give his experience of uh, what makes it a good application. Thank you very much, Charlie, for comprehensively going through the various awards that are available. I'll, uh, my name's uh, Professor Dilia Anumba. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Sheffield, and I'm chair of the NIHR Global Health Research Group on Preterm Birth Prevention and Management um, across Sheffield um, and a number of partner sites in Bangladesh, um, South Africa, um, and, and, and recently India with collaborations in uh, Ghana and Nigeria. I'm also faculty director of our integrated academic training here in Sheffield and I'm the chair of the NIHR Academy Global Health uh, Program Selection Committee. In this presentation, I'd like to share with you my personal reflections and insights into what us, this selection committee, are really looking for in a global health uh, SPAC application and now CADA. I'll cover the role of the NIHR uh, Program Selection Committee the common characteristics of a good application, and the top tips regarding presenting the applicant's experience, their placement, and how to communicate the benefits and impact of the placement on the applicant's career itself. I'll also try to prefer some views around how best to capture the host institution support, the value of the supervisor's statement of support, and the budget and finance proposal. I'll then conclude by outlining the assessment criteria um, which the selection committee tends to look at. So let's just start by talking about the role of the NIHR Global Health Program Selection Committee. The committee is comprised of a panel of global health and care professionals who provide uh, unbiased decision around the applications that have been made to the NIHR SPAC program and, and now the new CADA schemes. 
the, our, the role of the committee is really to review and assess applications and, and provide a recommendation on which applications meet the criteria and which should be funded for the Department of Health and Social Care to consider. We, the selection committee comprises approximately nine members, uh, which includes a chair, a deputy chair, and five members drawn from across the entire global health research program. There are also two NIHR Global Health Research Academy members who provide a, a, a trainee or early career researcher perspective to the work of the selection process. So what makes a good application? Um, our experience from the first cohort is really that there are some common characteristics uh, that make a good uh, application. One is that the proposal should demonstrate and propose a beneficial and impactful placement. And when we talk of benefit, it's about benefit to the applicant or the work person who's making the bid. And a good application should really bring out new skills and experiences which the applicant will acquire in a supportive environment uh, enabled by the actual placement itself. A good application should be by an early career researcher who's active in pursuing academic uh, research, working in a range of methodological and clinically oriented disciplines. Good applications usually uh, should evidence uh, essentially are the same, regardless of which particular uh, uh, discipline the applicants comes from, they should evidence, uh, regardless of um, discipline or seniority, seniority um, they should evidence that the person is going to acquire new skills in these areas and, and, and what the unique uh, strengths of the placement will, will provide. And talking about applicant experience, we're looking for applicants that demonstrate relevance in terms of the academics and skills that they'll acquire by undertaking that particular placement. And so the applicant experience should detail what have you been doing before? What's the research experience that you already have? You should also detail what areas of research interest uh, are being put forward and what research methods the applicant already has experience of. And then it also should uh, list out the research projects that the applicant has already led or made significant contributions into or to as a consequence of uh, them being really dedicated to research or having research potential. So any research you've done, any audits, evaluations, or policy experience that you have is relevant to the application and should be shown very clearly in that particular domain. What about any experience of community engagement and involvement in research? That is uh, highly important. And the selection committee looks at that also. Any other um, experiences that you may well have had? And very importantly, why is it important to undertake this placement at this particular point in the applicant's academic research career? Because sometimes placements can be relevant in the future, um, but also it's important to demonstrate why you want to take that, uh, undertake that placement at this particular point in the uh, research career, academic career. It's important to um, very clearly show the placement plan. The selection committee are looking for applicants who can very clearly show a concise plan. And this plan should really uh, uh, include evidence that you have in fact done some reflection of the gaps in your own knowledge and skill set. And you've also reflected on how the proposed placement will meet those needs. So if you've already acquired expertise in a specific area, it's no good having a placement just to do exactly the same thing you already know how to do. The second thing is why have you chosen the particular placement? And therefore you should eloquently speak to the benefit of going to the uh, placement host institution that you propose, 
with particular regards to issues such as the expertise available in that host institution, the facilities available and the equipment that you may not have in your own institution, which the uh, placement will enable. It's important to justify the length of the placement proposed um, and ensure that the duration uh, matches their ambition and your aspiration and your plan. And whether the timelines for the actual placement itself are realistic. And by that, we mean that it should not be too short or it should not be too long. It really should be appropriate. And in that regard, a, a Gantt of some sort or a timeline is helpful with regards to uh, justifying your placement plan. It's important to have clear and measurable outcomes from the actual placement itself. And what are the things that you'd like to uh, present as the indicators of success, such as publications done, manuscripts prepared, and the preparation for a competitive fellowship, either in collaboration with the host, with the host institution or others, or the basis of the new skills that you've acquired. The selection committee is also looking at the benefits and impacts of the placement. Uh, the applicant should really concisely articulate those benefits and impacts um, for such uh, a placement proposed. So the uh, specific questions will be, how will the proposed placement plan support your development in global health research? And how does it actually meet and complement your unique training and career development needs? And from a very personal perspective, what does success actually look like for you? And why is it important to do the placement at the time that you propose to do that? And particularly for career progression, the selection committee will be looking to see how the placement actually enhances your aspirations and goals to, for example, achieve a competitive research fellowship or move on to a doctoral career, a postdoctoral career, whatever that may be. These need to be well articulated and it should be obvious to the panel. Now, this is an area where in, in our experience from the first round, people don't quite um, sell themselves as well as they can. It's important to demonstrate very clearly what, why the host institution has been chosen. And a very important area is a supervisor statement. This really should be detailed. And there should be in the bid clarity around the fact that the supervisor will truly uh, provide support for the placement itself. It's probably not a good idea to just use a bland statement of um, support generically without some granularity around what will actually, what sort of support the host institution will provide. And the selection committee also looks at what, um, whether the supervisor's exp expertise fits with the aspirations of the applicant itself. What are the steps that will be required? And in terms of the benefits of the placement, does it fulfill the ODA as a requirement, which I'll talk about in the next slide or two. And it's important that uh, safeguarding uh, guidance is, is, is adhered to, and that's available as a link. You can see that, um, I'm sure we'll, we can put that in the chat for you to understand the NIHR safeguarding guidance around um, equity, around how to uh, manage uh, interactions and relationships between researchers, supervisors, and supervisees in the conduct of research. And we should all be familiar with the official development assistance, eligibility, and compliance criteria for NIHR-funded uh, research or projects. And so this placement is really important. Uh, it is important that the bid uh, should demonstrate how the award will directly and primarily affect uh, and benefit patients and the public in countries of the OECD DAC list, which are most of the low middle income countries. The list is available 
on NIHR websites and a whole bunch of other websites as well. So it's very important that that benefit is clear in regard to ODA countries. And so we should be specific in your application relating to which countries will actually benefit. Um, even if you're applying from say the UK, uh, the, the, the direct benefit really should be to a low middle income country, particularly perhaps uh, through your partnership. So just to round up, um, the key things that um, we look at in terms of the selection committee looks at, uh, will assess all eligible applicants. The first thing is, of course, it has to be eligible and, and that's the initial filter. And then the assessment criteria that are used are summarized on the slide. The first is the extent to which the placement will provide a high quality and stimulating research training experience that needs to be articulated fully. The second is with regards to the benefit to the applicant itself, and the application should demonstrate that uh, their research studies will be enhanced by this particular placement at the particular time that it is proposed for. The provision of academic supervision and support at both the employing organization who are releasing the applicant to go to the host institution, as well as in the host institution in terms of um, uh, bespoke supervision and support for the placement itself. And in this regard, I cannot overemphasize the uh, need to be very specific about the level of support and the nature of the support right through the placement program. It's also, we, the selection committee looks at the impact of the placement on personal and professional development and academic career trajectory. That should be eloquently stated and clearly stated rather um, in the actual application itself. And also the extent to which uh, the proposed training is not available in their employing organization. And this needs to be emphasized as well. So um, just visiting another institution as a host, when in fact all of the skills are available in, in the employing organization does not come across as a, place, uh, a credible placement. So there needs to be clarity around what the proposed training will uh, provide that is not available in the employing institution. And also the collaborative potential of the placement is, is important to uh, clarify whether new collaborations will be forged, whether new partnerships will be forged, either within the global health research programs or the UK-based NIH uh, infrastructures. And finally, the statement of support needs to be very carefully written uh, and in, in substantial detail to actually demonstrate that the host institution is committed uh, to enabling the applicant to attain their objectives. So that concludes uh, my uh, reflections on the what makes a good application. Uh, you can see some of those reflections as well when you look at the round one chairs report, which uh, has already been alluded to by Charlie, uh, whose link will also be made available to you. Thank you very much. I'll now pass you back to Charlie uh, for the next steps. Hi, Dizzy. Thanks very much for, for that really interesting presentation. It's always good to get a sense for what the selection committee are looking for in, a, in an application. And as, as Dilly said, that chair's report also just summarises a lot of the things that um, Dilly's touched on as, as well. So thanks for that, Dilly. Um, so now I um, want to hand over to um, Palavi, who I'm delighted is uh, joining us today. So. Lavi's a, a recent uh, Global Health Spark awardee, um, and she's just going to give you a little bit of background in terms of, of her research career journey that she's made, um, tell you a little bit about her placement, um, and then hopefully give you some top tips. So I'll uh, pass you over to um, Lavi now. So thank you, Lavi. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, I'll just uh, share my slides quickly. Um, thank you again, Charlie and the NIHR Academy for inviting me to share my experience uh, with the NIHR Global Health Research Spark Award today. 
So my name is Pallavi uh, and I am a project manager for the NIHR Right program, Prevention of Epilepsy by Reducing Neonatal Encephalopathy, also called the Prevent Study. Uh, I'm also a PhD student at uh, Imperial College London. So uh, I would like to start with providing a brief summary about my academic and uh, career journey. So I'm a registered nurse from India and my interest uh, towards academic research started uh, when I was a student, a student nurse, during which I had some preliminary training in uh, research methodology and some opportunities to take, undertake some uh, small research projects under the guidance of my professors. Um, however, uh, to pursue uh, research along with clinical practice was not a career option for me um, since clinical academic careers for nurses uh, or even for doctors or other healthcare professionals did not really exist in India. So I decided to go into public health in order to build a career in research. Uh, I obtained my postgraduate uh, degree from Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai, where I specialized in public health management and received further training in research. I then went on to work with uh, the Global Burden of Disease Study and later uh, also worked for a rural community health organization in South India. So in, uh, in 2019, I had the opportunity to join the PREVENT study under the supervision of Professor Sudhin Tail. Uh, and at PREVENT, unlike uh, my previous experiences, I had the opportunity to utilize um, my skills and knowledge in the capacity of a nurse as well as a public health researcher. Uh, it was during this time that I received the SPARC award to explore the health system factors associated with birth-related brain injury in LMICs. Uh, which was a strong enabling factor for my uh, successful PhD application at Imperial College London later. And uh, I'm currently doing my doctoral research uh, in the same area. So uh, the main reason why I applied for the Spark Award was to obtain uh, specific skills on uh, clinical neuroprotection, to learn more about the public health and health system aspects of birth-related brain injuries in uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, which in turn would allow me to submit a, you know, a strong uh, doctoral fellowship application. I, I also wanted to utilize this opportunity to interact uh, and learn from experts in the field. So I had planned my placements at Imperial College London, uh, LSHTM and uh, the University of Oxford. Um, now regarding my placement activities, um, given the international travel restrictions due to the pandemic, my placement was um, you know, completed both virtually as well as in person. Uh, I had the opportunity to take up some courses online uh, in the area of research designs and methods, uh, advanced qualitative research methods, uh, statistics, and also in grant writing from um, university uh, institutes like LSHTM, University of Oxford, University College London, and PHFI in India. Uh, I also worked remotely with the Center for Perinatal Neuroscience at Imperial College London under the supervision of Professor Thayil, during which I also worked on my PhD application, uh, then participated in various general club discussions and interacted with other early career researchers, uh, as well as uh, some senior uh, investigators. Uh, in terms of collaboration with uh, LSHTM, uh, I was involved with the, uh, in the discussion uh, and drafting of an NIHR Center grant proposal. Uh, thus obtaining a, a first-hand experience of writing a major grant application during my uh, Spark placement. Uh, although I could no longer uh, have an in-person uh, placement at, in a, at Imperial College London and other units in the UK, uh, after discussing with my supervisor and the NIHR, we decided to have a short in-person placement within India. So I was placed at the International Institute of Health Management Research in New Delhi, uh, which is also a collaborator institute uh, of the PREVENT study. And while at uh, IHMR, uh, under the direct supervision of Professor Tayul, Professor Toledano uh, from Imperial College London, and Professor Niyogi, who is the director of IHMR Delhi, I worked further on my research proposal and finalized my research plan. Uh, there are all, I also had the opportunity to work with an interdisciplinary team of public health researchers uh, to develop and deliver two rounds of a five-day global workshop, online workshop, on qualitative research methods and analysis. Uh, one was conducted in September and the other one in November last year. Uh, this was done in, co uh, in collaboration with IHMR Delhi, Imperial College London, and the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. 
Um, and that was an amazing experience for me and a great opportunity uh, to network with several academics, uh, researchers, clinicians, including those who participated in the workshop from across the globe. Um, now coming to the challenges. So uh, my main challenge was the international travel restriction uh, imposed due to the pandemic that resulted in the cancellation of all my in-person placements at Imperial College London, uh, Oxford University and LSHTM. Uh, however, the uh, NIHR was very uh, kind enough to support me through this period and arranged for um, alternate ways through which I could achieve my objectives. So online courses were one such option, which really helped me. And once the domestic travel opened up, uh, I traveled to the NIH, uh, to uh, IHMR Delhi, where I had a very short placement, in-person placement. Uh, now coming to some of the benefits um, of my Spark Award. Perhaps the most important outcome of my placement uh, was me being able to secure a fully funded position with Imperial College London as a doctoral student. Uh, and the Spark Award also helped me broaden my understanding about uh, health system factors and their impact on birth-related brain injury in LMICs, uh, along with improving my research skills uh, through attending online courses, as well as through discussions with experts. I've also been able to build my academic and professional network uh, around this time through various activities, including the workshops um, that I co-organized with my colleagues. I also had the opportunity to engage uh, in some of the discussions held by the NIHR Academy in topics related to the capacity building of early career researchers from LMICs. So in short, uh, through this award, I was able to work more on developing my research skills, uh, communication and networking skills, um, leadership as well as teaching skills, uh, which will immensely help me in uh, becoming a researcher in the area of maternal and neonatal health in uh, LMICs. Uh, regarding my future work, uh, I am now working on my PhD research, where I'm utilizing all the knowledge, skills, and net, uh, academic networks I've obtained through my uh, Spark placement to address the issues of birth-related brain injury in India uh, using a health systems uh, perspective. Uh, I'm also planning to continue the collaborations with colleagues from Imperial College London, uh, IHMR Delhi, and also LSTM uh, to further plan and implement more advanced workshops in, qual in qualitative research, methodology, as well as uh, scientific writing. Um, so uh, I would like to encourage all the earlier career researchers uh, based at LMICs who are eligible to apply for the Spark Award and other fellowships from NIHR. Um, as it will provide immense opportunities uh, to enhance one's academic uh, career through building your research, technical skills, uh, as well as your networking and collaboration uh, opportunities. And as you devise your placement objectives, uh, the most important factor to focus on should be your long-term vision and how you see yourself progress in your professional uh, journey. Uh, you will also have to be very flexible uh, with your placement plan as um, even and or maybe even have a few backup plans uh, to start with, because for instance, um, in my case, uh, I had I had to constantly repurpose my plans due to the various logistical challenges caused by the pandemic. So the focus should be on your long term uh, vision and your uh, placement objectives. So be ready to be very flexible with your plans as well. And most importantly, when in doubt, always reach out to the NIHR team. Uh, they will always be there to support you in all the stages of your uh, award. Um, with that, I would like to conclude by thanking uh, the entire NIHR Academy team for this amazing opportunity you have provided and for all the guidance and support throughout my placement period um, and beyond. Thank you all so much for listening. Thanks, Palavi. That was a great presentation and, and really good to hear from, I think, individual awardees as to you know, what you did and the benefits and impact that you uh, had on your career. And it's great that obviously now you're undertaking your PhD and well on your way to be a, a future leader. So uh, thank you very much. Now we'll uh, start the, the Q&A session um, and start sort of answering some of your, your questions. So I'm just going to um, have a look at um, what's coming up at the moment. Um, so one of the questions uh, we've got is regarding um, eligibility for the, the SPARC scheme. Um, the question is, uh, regarding eligibility for the SPARC, would all staff costed on an NHR right programme be eligible or only doctoral students funded by the grant and therefore our academy members? 
So uh, just to make that clear, so basically um, the award is open to anybody who is receiving financial uh, or in-kind um, in support from their Global Health Programme Award um, or Global Health Professorship Award um, and are able to, to be um, eligible to, uh, to apply. So um, I say you don't necessarily, what we're about is investing in people and people's academic careers. So for the Spark Award, you can either be currently undertaking, for example, a, a master's, a PhD or a postdoc that's funded obviously via one of those programme awards, so via that right programme award, or you must be um, employed by um, and on that grant, but looking to progress your academic career and, and, and with support from your programme, looking to apply um, for one of those formal academic career development awards. So I say it's sort of a either or. So you either must be, I say, currently undertaking a, a master's, PhD or postdoc, or if that isn't the case, you must obviously um, sort of be employed by that um, on that programme and uh, looking to pursue an academic um, research career and have support from that programme. Um, OK. So I think then the next question is, uh, are there any particular um, research areas determined uh, for the um, NIHR Spark? So in terms of, you know, um, research and sort of remit of research, basically the NIHR funds applied um, health and um, social care research. So as long as you meet that general um, remit um, and also potentially, obviously, your individual um, global health programme, for example, so where if you're based in a global health um, right or a HPSR or one of those units and groups, obviously your specific programme award has um, a particular focus for research. So obviously your research must be um, within their own sort of individual um, remit as well. But because obviously these awards don't necessarily, don't obviously fund research, it's more about your developing your individual career um, and um, sort of developing your research training experience obviously then um, it's about you rather than necessarily you undertaking a, obviously a piece of research. Uh, so I'm just wait. Another question that's coming in. Uh, one of the major challenges for researchers in LMEX is limited network. Any chances NIHR will link us up with potential supervisor once you choose the host institution? Um, so that's something um, that really we, we would ask you to get in touch. So obviously, if you're if you are based in one of those units or groups or on a right program or a HPSR program, each individual one of those will have a, a training lead or a, or a program director. So we'd really encourage you to, to reach out to those individuals in the first instance and your primary supervisor if you are undertaking a, a career development board and really get their help um, in terms of uh, trying to find a potential placement. So there, as I say, we've got what we call our um, Spark Where Can I Go guide. So take a look at that. That really does list, um, it's not a comprehensive guide. So, um, you know, by any means, there's, there's not everything detailed there, but there will be a list of um, various different units or groups or right um, calls, their sort of research areas and backgrounds um, that you might want to have a look at as well as obviously um, domestically in the UK, um, there are a number of NIHR sites as well that you might want to do a placement in. So really, I would say, reach out to your primary supervisor and your training lead, talk about sort of potential placement ideas, um, why, what you might want to do, have a look at those guides to find um, potentially a, a good um, location or site for you to do your placement and then reach out to that site or, or placement um, opportunity. And there will be um, various people um, that you can contact that are listed in our um, Find Your Training Lead there that you can use to, to help you with that as, as well. I say the guidance notes really do um, go through sort of step-by-step step the various different approaches um, you can take to, to you know, arranging those placements. So I've just, there's a question there saying, if I've had a RSTMH or NIHR small grant, can I apply? Um, so, so yeah, there is no, you know, if you've had one of our awards, that's 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 great. Uh, as I say, but if, if there is the Spark Award that you're wanting to apply for, 
um, obviously you do need to meet that um, standard eligibility criteria as well. So you need to be based within one of those global health programmes um, already. So you say if you are based in one of those units or groups or right or HPSR programmes, either currently undertaking, as I say, one of those formal um, career development awards, so doing a master's, a PhD or a postdoc, um, say so you're more than welcome to apply or if you've recently completed one of those um, and you're wanting to, to move on to that next step you must have the support from your program and um, they must be investing in you really in your career um, for you to apply. Um, so is capacity building and training in parent and public and pay sorry patient and public engagement uh, for healthcare professionals and public under the the remit of of CADA. Um, so in, in terms of um, CADA, obviously that's aimed at um, the program level, and it's aimed obviously at supporting your individual um, global health programs uh, academic career development needs. So if obviously um, that is a, obviously um, community engagement involvement is obviously one of the NIHR's main areas that we're you know we do support and we actively encourage so if there are a, pro, a number of program um, activities that you would like to um, develop that would meet the needs of your cohort and develop the training um, around that that absolutely would be um, eligible for um, a CADA award so I say it's it's really about develop you know assessing your um, cohort that where your program is assessing their needs and if as I say community and engagement is one of those needs where you feel that there, there would be a benefit of um, you know further training in um, and that would help obviously with academic career development that definitely would fall within the, the CADA's area of remit. So I'm conscious I've, there's been a lot of obviously um, eligibility and, and remit questions obviously that I've, that I've answered but please do put any in the the Q and A for uh, you know for Dilly and, and Palavi and, and really make the most of, of, of their experience. So if there's anything that you think would be good to hear from uh, a selection committee perspective as what makes a good application or from Palavi, you know, do make the most of uh, while they're here as well. So one of the questions is how does some of us that do not belong to any of the global health group join one, especially those of us in in Elmix. Um, Dilly, I might as I might draw on your experience in terms of uh, obviously with with you holding a, a group uh, for the NIHR. Um, is there anything that you want to to add to that? Um, well, I guess it's it's hard to say. I guess the best thing would be to. Uh, look on the website uh, from a pragmatic standpoint and find out where the groups and units and right programs are funded. And if you feel that they're relevant to your academic research career aspirations, write to the groups to find out whether there are opportunities for um, uh, being employed within the program or incorporated in the program, um, if there are vacancies. But you do need to join the groups and they need to assess your um, eligibility to be employed so that would be the best approach and if you're not sure where the right pro where the programs are i'm sure the nihr uh, charlie and uh, the rest of the team will be more than happy to point you to where the correct uh, the programs are in your own country and your own geography if you're from a low middle income country um, and so you can contact them and find out whether they can they can uh, meet your uh, career aspirations. So that's, we do get lots of inquiries in that regard. And sometimes it does mean that partners in the respective countries are able to uh, engage these, uh, engage people directly. So check the website and also ask the NIHR for any programs that are relevant in your own um, context and in your own country um, and see whether you your skills can be improved uh, by joining up with them if they have funded positions. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks, Dilly. Um, I'm conscious um, that I'm afraid we've we've um, overrun slightly for the for the webinar, um, so we'll we'll have to um, stop. I'm afraid, but really, thank you for everybody's participation and, and questions, and in particular, thank you to to Dilly and Palavi for for joining today and and giving their perspectives. It's it's great to get that first hand experience and uh, and their views. So thank you very much for for joining us. 